So thank you very much for asking me to speak at your workshop. Uh, and I'm going to cover just a little bit of uh, what happened with the World Health Organization study into the origins of SARS-CoV-2, which of course is a course of COVID-19 disease. And this has been something that's caused a, uh, a, a lot of media and political interest uh, really over the last few months. I don't have any particular uh, disclosures to uh, declare. So look, the world first became alerted to SARS-CoV-2 in the end of December 2019, when an alert was put out on ProMed. And of course now, uh, as of the 24th of June, uh, we have reported almost 180 million cases uh, with almost 4 million deaths. And we all know that this is probably a very significant underreporting of the true numbers of, uh, of cases. So clearly there was an interest to uh, investigate what might have been the cause of this outbreak. Where did the virus come from? How did the virus uh, cause disease? And how did that disease unfold? So the World Health Assembly asked the WHO, the World Health Organization and China to investigate the origins of the virus. And this was to be done in two phases. And this is important. The first phase was really reviewing what information is available or was available uh, in terms of how the virus got going in Wuhan uh, and looking at those early clusters of disease to, to understand uh, uh, perhaps the origin. But also importantly, to develop the next phase of studies uh, to, to undertake the work to finally sort out the origins, not just in China, but indeed uh, elsewhere. I put up the list of participants here just to show you that it was a, uh, a large group of independent uh, uh, experts from around the world, uh, assisted by the WHO. Uh, none of us are employed by WHO, um, uh, and we took this on as independent experts. Uh, the types of people involved included veterinary, uh, veterinarians, it included uh, people expert in coronaviruses, bat coronaviruses, as well as clinicians and human uh, epidemiologists. Uh, we worked with a, a group from the China uh, National Health Commission, uh, which is their Department of Health, and also with assistance from a number of international organizations. And again, we have to be very clear here that this study was about understanding the origins of the pandemic. It wasn't about examining the responses to the pandemic, which is sometimes confused. Uh, how countries have responded both well and badly is, is another whole separate examination. This is really about finding the virus responsible. So we formed uh, over a long series of meetings before we went to Wuhan, uh, the different working groups uh, that were to be involved. That included a group looking at the animal and environmental aspects of this, a group looking at the molecular epidemiology. By that, I mean the early uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequences from Wuhan uh, and also coronaviruses from bats and, and animals and so on. And then the third group was looking at the clinical epidemiology uh, of the early cluster or clusters in Wuhan and a review of the surveillance systems for other diseases that might have given some indication as to what was going on. So our approach fell into those different groups. And what we really wanted to do was try and make the data from the different groups interlink with each other. Uh, like in any uh, big uh, uh, investigation or in any big health system, people often work in limited uh, areas and don't necessarily collaborate across different groups uh, to enhance the data that they're getting. So we focus very much on trying to link up the various data sources that we were examining. Now this is uh, of course uh, the epidemic curve for the first few hundred cases in China and we were focused particularly on uh, the cases in December highlighted in red down the bottom. Uh, so this was in the few weeks before the outbreak really took off in January and February uh, 2020. Uh, now, we know that there are about 174 cases of SARS-CoV-2 in December 2019. And we know that around half of those cases were linked to the Huanan market, 
a wet market in uh, uh, Wuhan, but in fact, quite a number of other cases did not appear to have a direct linkage to the market. And that becomes important as we, as we go on. Not that we're talking about the responses here, but this epidemic curve uh, uh, from uh, their paper in the New England Journal uh, did show that uh, the sequencing was completed by the China CDC on the uh, uh, 2nd or 3rd of January, but not actually, actually released uh, until uh, about the 10th or so of January, meaning that there was a, a time period where the sequence wasn't available, which is of course crucial for developing diagnostic tests and understanding origins. Now, we undertook a whole range of epidemiologic studies to, to sort of tease out the information. We looked at the early cases, and we also asked uh, Chinese authorities to go back and look at unexplained pneumonias uh, that might have occurred in the couple of months before the first few cases were recognised. And we also looked at some of their influenza-like illnesses and severe acute respiratory uh, infection work uh, that's done routinely for influenza to try and uh, uh, see if there are any signals that might have explained that something was going on. And we did uh, examinations of other things as well, including importantly, the mortality data due to pneumonia or indeed all causes, as well as trying to identify whether there was stored material that people could go back and do uh, testing on. This is just a picture of the Huanan market. Uh, uh, this is now closed, of course, uh, but you can see even just from these pictures how easy it would be for an outbreak uh, of any description to occur. Narrow, uh, dark uh, uh, alleyways, open drainage, uh, uh, cages and pits for, uh, for live animals and dead animals to be stored and sold. And on the right-hand side, uh, uh, living quarters that were very closely associated with the stall selling material. So all of this is a classic scenario for uh, causing an outbreak. And then the other thing, of course, that's really uh, uh, important here is to understand the relatedness between the market and indeed the rest of the population. And you can see this picture here of a market and behind, of course, very close by, uh, very extensive housing that is typical of uh, modern Chinese cities. So the connection between markets and big populations is very apparent. Now we looked at mortality uh, data from pneumonia uh, in late 2019 to try and identify peaks. Now clearly in uh, uh, early January 2020, there was a massive increase in deaths due to uh, 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 pneumonia, clearly due to the outbreak. And this was much more marked in Wuhan than it was in other parts of the uh, of Hubei province, which is nearby. Uh, and this again is, is, is some suggestion that, of course, that the virus effects really started in Wuhan rather than elsewhere in Hubei province and then being brought to Wuhan city itself. And we've also looked at similar data from uh, other parts of China as well. Now, this is important uh, 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 data and this relates to the sequences that were uh, uh, generated in the very early phases of the uh, pandemic. So sequences taken from patients generated in uh, uh, December or, or, or even the following January. And what, what this sort of haplotype network shows you is sequences and how di distant or close they might be to each other, uh, but also overlays a color showing when these sequences became available. And on this slide, the, the bluer the, the circles, the more, more or the earliest these sequences were. And basically, without going into detail, what it shows you that already in the first month or two, there was a reasonable sequence diversity. I mean, these viruses don't uh, mutate as much as other viruses, such as influenza or HIV or hepatitis C but they do mutate a little bit. And also the, uh, uh, you can see that some of the blue circles representing cases are already a little bit distant from each other. So the implication of this is 
that the virus was circulating in Wuhan probably for some time before cases became readily apparent. Uh, and of course, we now know, uh, and they didn't know this at the time, we now know that severe pneumonia causing hospitalization uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection is only the tip of the iceberg and that the bulk of spread and transmission occurs between people who are otherwise asymptomatic or only mildly uh, affected. So in other words, uh, these sequences really do uh, uh, suggest that the virus was probably present for at least some weeks or even months beforehand. Now you can model this sort of work uh, uh, looking at the sequences uh, and work out the time to most recent common ancestor of the virus. So you take the sequences from a time point and see how they uh, diverge over time uh, in a forwards direction. And you can go backwards from that to try and get a sense of when the virus might have first appeared in humans. And looking at this sort of evolutionary rate, there's a whole range of these studies that have been done around the world. And we did this also with the early Chinese sequences. And the, being conservative, the virus was probably circulating in Wuhan from mid-November, uh, at least, uh, uh, and cases weren't really becoming apparent until uh, uh, mid to late December. Uh, so, and some modeling uh, su suggests that it might've even been earlier than that. Now that's also important for understanding whether SARS-CoV-2 was present in other countries around the world before it appeared in Wuhan. And there've been some uh, uh, slight suggestions of this with cases uh, diagnosed serologically in Europe uh, or in sewerage and so on, also in the USA. Uh, and and uh, if the virus had been circulating and unrecognized in Wuhan before December, then that's still quite consistent with the virus popping up elsewhere because people might have been traveling during that time. Uh, of course, you could also say that the virus could have come from other places into Wuhan and then just exploded there. Uh, it, it, it's pretty hard to tell, but I think most countries should really be going back and looking in that period of time before their first few cases became available. Even if I take a local example in Sydney, where I'm from, in Australia, we had our first case, I think, on the 25th of January, 2020. But until then, we were having three flights a week direct from Wuhan to Sydney. Uh, and so it's quite possible that the virus could have even been present in, 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 in Sydney beforehand. But these things need to be uh, worked on. Again, a lot of interest in the animal and environmental studies because of, of the experience with SARS and bird flu and MERS and lots of other viruses where there's an animal to human connection and typically with bats where there's a bat to some sort of intermediate animal uh, into humans uh, being a really uh, a commonly or relatively commonly identified pathway. So there's been a lot of work done to try and identify SARS-CoV-2 related viruses. And we know that bats in China, in other countries in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and so on, Malaysia, uh, even in Japan and so on, that SARS-related coronaviruses are present in many, bat, in many bats and that the uh, uh, location of these bats can be extensive, covering many different countries uh, across uh, Southeast Asia, even into Central Asia and towards Europe. So, so uh, um, you know, bats really do seem to be very significant player here. Now, a lot of work has been done on bats uh, uh, in various countries, including around the time of the outbreak and also in other animals, particularly those associated with the markets in Huanan that have been identified as a risk factor. Um, and of course, when those markets were closed, which was the end of December, so many weeks after the cases that had been appearing, at that time, uh, the animal samples collected were negative. But of course, that's well after the event has already happened. And unfortunately, we don't have material from before the pandemic uh, started that might have given a clue whether the, this virus was present in animals. Um, and of course, as you would expect, once an outbreak happens, for example, in the marketplace, then it's not surprising that you get environmental sampling that is positive for SARS-CoV-2. And that was certainly uh, recognized. 
again, uh, we visited a number of laboratories and the Wuhan Institute of Virology has had a lot of media attention uh, related to the laboratory leak hypothesis. Uh, this is a very big laboratory built with French and Chinese uh, collaboration. Um, and look, the laboratory leak hypothesis is an easy one to say, but extremely difficult to prove. We have left this on the table for further investigation if evidence becomes available. Uh, and I think that that's important. But in terms of the likelihood of this in comparison, say, to the bat animal human uh, connection, uh, we rate that one uh, uh, much higher. Now, again, I'm not going to go into detail here, but what uh, we tried to do was put all the different hypotheses onto a figure and identify how virus could move through these different ideas, uh, causing an outbreak and ultimately, of course, a pandemic, uh, and then try and fit in evidence uh, into those various arrows, if you like, showing progression of infection. So I'm not going to go into detail of that because the pathways are different for, for each of the hypotheses, but I think it's important to remember that even if the virus gets into humans directly, say from bats or from a laboratory leak or from other animals or from frozen food, whatever has been identified as a possible hypothesis, the evolution of the virus may well continue after it's either been in animals for a period of time or in, indeed in humans for a period of time. And often the, the transmission from humans depends on things like mass gatherings or marketplaces or travel, all of those sorts of things. And during that time, the virus can develop uh, mutations that make it more likely to be a uh, pathogen of humans and perhaps its original source. And of course, we see that now with the emergence of different variants of concern and so on. So as I said in the beginning, this was really about uh, uh, two phases. The second part of the, the study was really developing the sorts of tests we need or, or studies we need to do to take this further. Clearly, it's naive to think that we would have found the answer to this you know, in a short visit to Wuhan. If it were easy, we wouldn't have had to go there in the first place, of course. But you know, what are the sorts of works uh, that need to be done to take the evidence further? And again, I'm not going to go into those. Uh, you can read those in the WHO report uh, itself, but they include animal studies, they include human studies, they include uh, looking at uh, uh, stored samples and so on from blood banks and other things like that. Uh, and, and the work needs to obviously be done in China, but also in other countries uh, where either the animals might circulate or marketplaces that are similar might be present. Uh, or, 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 or where there's evidence of early infection, all of those sorts of things. So, you know, one does need to take a kind of worldwide approach to this sort of work, um, but obviously China is an important focus. So I'll finish up there by, by saying the investigations around origins of, di of disease are complex and may take many years to answer. As you know well, uh, uh, Ebola viruses uh, has been causing outbreaks in, in, in Africa for uh, 40 odd years. And it's really only in the last few years that the origin of that virus in bats has become apparent. The same with SARS back in 2003. It did really take about 14 or 15 years for the uh, uh, viral origin of that to become available. So I think uh, 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 this could take a long time one would be optimistic that we will get the answer, of course. And I think it's worth uh, saying that the, it is important to separate the science from the politics here, because the more people argue about the politics and try and blame people or remove attention from their own management of the pandemic and so on, the harder it is to do the science. So I think uh, uh, to get the science done, you need collaboration and cooperation uh, and that requires diplomacy and common sense from all sides uh, of the debate. Uh, in the end, you have to list the likely causes or hypotheses as to the causes. Uh, they then underpin what further work you need to be done. So I think those are the really take home messages from this. If you want to read the report in, in detail, it is available online on the WHO uh, website. 
So look, I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, if there's the opportunity to answer questions, we can do that. So thank you very much for your attention.